We come now to our second lesson under the title of Pestilence Falling Upon Us. And we're looking at Exodus chapter 5 and verse number 3. We must realize that this is Moses not only leading Israel and representing God to God's people, but here he is teaching or attempting to teach Pharaoh, attempting to teach one who is called the powers that be. So he says uh, in verse number two, we find Exodus 5, Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Now Moses is fixing to tell him who the Lord is. He says, I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Knowing the Lord has to do to, with him to not letting Israel go, or not knowing the Lord. They're one, they're, he puts them together. I don't know the Lord, so I'm not going to let Israel go. He's going to come to know the Lord before it's over with, but it ain't going to be good for him. It's not going to be pleasant. And they said, verse 3 of Exodus chapter 5, which is where we get our lesson today. And they said, the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. This is not just hearsay. We've been meeting with God. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Now, they didn't come out and say everything that they wanted or that, that was going to happen when we're going to leave Israel Excuse me, we're going to leave Egypt and never coming back. That's, they didn't say that. Didn't tell him a lie. Just said, maybe if we just tell him we are going out three days in sacrifice, that's small enough that maybe he can accept it. We're going to trim this thing down and just tell him a little of it. Not a lie. That's what we're going to do. But then they, maybe he can come then later to understand he needs to let us go completely. So they said, let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Now listen, lest or unless he, God, fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. So they said, our worshiping God has to do with either the falling or the not falling of the pestilence upon us. And Pharaoh said, me not knowing God means I'm not going to let you go. So God's going to have to bring himself to bear upon Pharaoh, not in a, a salvation way, not in a saving way, but in a sovereign way to make him see his power. That's what God did what if God willing to show it make it? here I go trying to quote something and can't do it Romans 9 22 I believe it is what if God willing to show his power and willing to show his might and make his power known let me read it to you what if God yet yeah, is Romans 9 22 willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and he's already said up here earlier in this chapter, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So God was willing to show his wrath. So he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And it was in order that he might make his power known, that my name might be known and declared throughout the whole earth. And he says, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. That's Pharaoh. That's the taskmasters of Egypt. I'm going to have to tolerate these boys while I am bringing about your deliverance. For the next verse says, And at the same time that he, God, might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore or before prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So God was willing to manifest his wrath and to make his power known. His power of endurance with the vessels of wrath, Pharaoh and all those who had Egypt, had Israel in bondage. But to make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. At the same time, show Israel 
what a great God he was and increased himself from being known just as the mighty uh, God or God Almighty to being known as Jehovah, the one who delivers you, the one who adopts you, and the one who guides you. It's going to be a more personal relationship with you, Israel, and it's going to happen at this time. A lot going on here. When there is a plague in the earth, there is a lot going on. The things that are seen are here to manifest the, the glory of Almighty God. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the invisible things of God, from the creation of the world, from things created, are clearly seen. We clearly see the, see the invisible things of God being understood by the things that are made. We understand more about God during this time of pandemic, during this time of pestilence. God increases his revelation to us as Jehovah God. I make my name more intimate with you. And Jesus said, abiding in my name will cause you to come to be able to mediate to God yourself. Not that I'm going to pray the Father for you, but you can ask the Father in my name and he will give, grant it. Christian, are you stale? Have you just quit with God? Have you lost your first love? Have, are you letting the embers of God's love die out in your soul and just say, well, I'm saved? How would you like that if the one that you married to or the one you're in love with did that to you? You need to come to understand that we need to constantly increase in the awareness of God. He is going to promote a revelation of himself that had never been known, not even by Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. And now Moses is going to get it, and the children of Israel is going to get it, in a time of great destruction and of a great plague and pestilence. Why can't that be the same thing with you, dear Christian? Why don't you bestir thyself and come more completely and wholly to God? Why don't you learn to quit just doing things out of duty and come to do them out of devotedness to God because you love him? He said, you've lost your first love. You're not hot. You're not cold. You're lukewarm. Make me sick. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You may not be a Christian if you don't continue on in the increase of God's love within your soul. But God have mercy. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 28. I mean, let's go back to the front of your Bibles. Not that we have been there before in this lesson. Deuteronomy 28, and you will recognize this. The first 14 verses is what happens if you abide in me and the blessings that come. Beginning with verse number 15 is if you don't hearken unto me, the curses that will come. Let me read you a few verses here. Deuteronomy 28, 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And he begins to list them all out. Drop down to verse 20. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto, uh, unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou, thou hast forsaken me. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with a sword and with blasting and with mildew and, and, and they shall pursue thee until thy shall perish. And I'm going to tell you, 
You're going to pray, but in verse number 23, I'm going to make the heavens to be brass. Your prayers are not going to get through. They're going to bounce off, and I'm not going to hear you. Because you do not obey me, you did not hearken unto my voice, you do not come to know my name. You don't continue on to know the Lord. You're just going through religious motions. Zechariah chapter 14 has a very unusual passage in it. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse number 16. Zechariah 14 and verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. The relationship of all the nations in all the world to God's people and to the place where God has chosen to call his name has to do with your here physical but understood spiritual prosperity. Now listen at verse 18. Zechariah 14, 18. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. What did Moses say to Pharaoh? Let us go three days into the desert to keep the Feast of God's, uh, 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 of God's law. Uh, unless a pestilence fall upon us. God actually said this through the prophet Zechariah, he said, if Egypt doesn't come and worship me and participate in the Feast of Tabernacles, this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Unless you tabernacle with God, unless you come to know God, this thing's going to fall upon you. Moses is trying to be faithful to tell Pharaoh. I'm trying my best to be faithful to tell you and whoever else can watch this on the internet. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Yes, it's a yoke. Yes, you have to learn. You have to enter the burden of the Lord Jesus Christ and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. There's nothing any sweeter, dear soul, than to be yoked up with Jesus Christ. You're going to have burdens in your life anyhow, and, and yet being able to have a yoke with Christ is a, a great and glorious thing. And it says, in that day, verse number 20 of Zechariah 14, shall there be upon the bells of the horses, and all this is in capital letters, holiness unto the Lord. The common things of horses going around with bells on them is going to be ringing holiness unto the Lord. There's coming a time when God shall cause all those that worship him to be gathered together in the holiness and the glory of God. And it's just going to be, and I hate to say this word, common and ordinary. The glory of God is going to just be that which is the status quo. Listen to what he says next. Not just the horses, holiness unto the Lord, but the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Your pots and pans are going to be holy. They're going, to, they're going to be blessed. They're going to be sanctified. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts and all they that sacrifice. If you enter into the sacrifice of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall come and take of them and seethe, that is, boil things therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite 
in the house of the Lord of hosts. There's going to come a purity and a holiness that God's people are going to be able to enter into, but you're going to have to come now in, to, in the way that God has ordained. I am not any way or some way. I am the way, Jesus said. There's no other way but this. Come to Jesus. Come to God by the person of Jesus Christ. Take his yoke upon you. Learn of him, and you will come to be able to enter into holiness unto the Lord. Even your common everyday things will become things that are sanctified, things that will be used to edify you and build up others in the faith. That's what God is going to bring you to. But I thought it was interesting that God mentioned the nation of Israel. No, excuse me, I'll get it right in a minute. That the nation of Egypt should involve themselves in the Feast of Tabernacles when that is exactly what Moses told Pharaoh he should do in Exodus chapter 5 and verse number 3. Now, in Isaiah chapter 19, Isaiah, here's another one that might surprise you. In Isaiah chapter 19, I don't know where to start. Verse 18, Isaiah 19 and verse 18. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts. One shall be called the city of destruction. There'll be only one out of five, or one out of these six, rather, that shall be lost. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. You can't come into the city limits of Egypt without seeing this great stone raised up to make you understand this is a place where God is. And it shall that pillar shall be a sign and for a witness unto the Lord, a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. And they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a Savior, and a great one, and he shall deliver them. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it, they're just not going to give lip service. They're going to do what they promised God. And the Lord shall smite Egypt. You say, that don't sound right. Well, it is. Who is he that the Father does not chastise? If you're not chastened by the Lord, then you're a bastard, not a son. So he says, the Lord shall smite Egypt. And listen to the next phrase. He shall smite and heal it. He says, and they shall return even to the Lord. And he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. In that day there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians shall come into Egypt. And the Egyptian into Assyria. And the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. The borders are going to be removed. Revelation said there will be no more sea. There won't be any separation of nations. We're all going to be one. We're all one in Christ, male and female, Jew and Greek, and so forth. We're all one in Christ. They're going to be a blending of the spiritual. And it says, in that day, I'm reading Isaiah 19, verse 24. In that day shall Israel be a third with Egypt and Assyria. Israel, upon whom uh, we Americans put far too much stock in national Israel. He said here that spiritual Israel is just going to be one third of those who make up the kingdom of God. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people. Can you believe that's in your Bible? 
Blessed be Egypt, my people, and blessed be Assyria, the work of my hands, and blessed be Israel, mine inheritance. Amazing. All of this happened that God might diminish national distinctions and bring into one all in Christ. There's one plague that God brought forth, and I believe it was the plague, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in, it was the seventh plague in Exodus 9, 13 through 25, uh, of the hail with fire mingled uh, with it, and, and he said, bring all of your animals in, and bring all your servants in from the field. Bring the cows into your house. Anything you leave out is going to be killed. And the thing that I'm wanting to get to you to see is in that passage, it says that even some of the Egyptians believed that word, and they came in with their servants and with their cattle, and they were saved alive. Dear soul, we don't really know and realize the extent of God's kingdom. He says it's a kingdom without walls. There's no city limits, son. There are brothers and sisters throughout this whole earth that know the Lord. May not speak my language, may not eat like I eat, may not dress like I dress, may not look like I look, but they're the Lord's people. In the book of the Revelation, chapter number 5, in verse number 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why is the Lord Jesus Christ worthy to open the seals of history and show what the progress of the church is going to be from that point on? He says, For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Next two words. Out of every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So we understand, dear soul, that Jesus Christ, by his blood, will redeem some out of every kindred and language and people and nation. And that Zechariah passage just opens up and shows to you that Israel is not going to be greater than Assyria, and Assyria is not going to be greater than Egypt, and Egypt's not going to be greater than Israel. Each, of, each one of them will be but a third, represent a third of the kingdom of God. Having read of Revelation 5, 9, look at Acts chapter 2. You know what Acts chapter 2 is? You say, yeah, it's, it's when the Holy Ghost fell. Okay. But would you notice verse number 10? Well, let's start with verse 8. And how hear we every man in our own language wherein we were born? And it begins to list the 17 different nations that were there in Jerusalem on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell. And listen who, what nations were, were uh, present. Verse 9, Acts 2. Parthians and Medes and Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Pergia and Pamphylia in Egypt. Did you realize that God fulfilled his prophecy in Zechariah chapter 14 by there being some Egyptian believers at Pentecost? Pergia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya around Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Creeks and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Amazing, dear soul. In the middle of one of the worst times in Egypt, pandemic, pestilence, destruction like they'd never seen 
God said, you're guilty of the blood of my people. So the river is going to be turned to blood. But the river is where you drown the boy babies. And you're going to be held responsible for their blood. And I want you to know, I'm going to kill all your firstborn because Israel is my firstborn. So in the midst of God getting glory from his righteous judgments upon these stiff-necked, hard-hearted people, Pharaoh hardened his heart. I will not let him go. I don't know who God is. Don't have many people to confess that. God said, in the midst of all that, there's going to be a revelation of me. My name is going to be increased in the revelation and the knowledge of God from God Almighty to the Lord Jehovah. Some of the uh, Egyptians brought their cows and their, and their servants and themselves in. They heard the word of Moses and they obeyed it. Zechariah 14 tells you that they shall be included in God's elect. Acts chapter 2 and verse 10 said they were present there at, at Pentecost. Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 9 said, Jesus Christ's blood shall save, save some out of every nation. Don't believe that just because there is a devastation of social activity in America that God's not at work. Don't you dare believe that God is not prospering in his glory in America and other nations at this present moment. Last count that I heard, America has some 800,000 plus people, four times as much as any other nations, people who are afflicted with this virus. It's awful. It is unbelievable. But dear soul, don't you dare think just because of what you see around you, it looks bad that God is not getting glory from it the bad thing would be for you to miss out on it. The bad thing would be for me not to recognize and understand the benefits of God manifesting himself to us in a greater way. Don't call me anymore God Almighty like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did, but call me Jehovah God. I am the Lord. And it was an issue. Who shall I say has sent me? Exodus chapter 3. I am that I am, Exodus 3.14. Moses went into there knowing God was I am. But when he got in the middle of it and the pestilence began to come and the ten plagues began to be manifest, God answers his question and increases the revelation of who God is. Wouldn't you like to come out of this mess far better spiritually than what you were when you were before you went into it. I got an email from a dear saint of God. He said, now that this pandemic has happened and through an increased hunger for an understanding of God, I am now not just doing my duty in studying the Bible, but I have now come to be lost in a intensive searching for God in the scriptures and I even forget what time it is I've never done this before my my searching for the person of Christ is greater than my study of traditional religion and it's all because of this pandemic God's no respecter of persons you could be like that why not don't you want in on it? Don't abuse or misuse your pandemic. In Acts chapter 14, the 14th chapter of Acts, Paul and Barnabas are in Lystra. And Paul heals, they heal a, 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 a crippled man. 
And we get in on the story in Acts chapter 14, and it says uh, in verse number 11, And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, Lyconia, Never mind. The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. These are the gods. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurus because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. They were going to sacrifice these oxen and proclaim Paul and Barnabas to be gods. Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their clothes and ran in among the people crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities, excuse me, from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Now listen. Who in times past... God has spoken to us in times past, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, by the prophets. But he hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. It's divided into two distinct times. Times past and now in this present age, now that Jesus has come. Who in times past suffered or permitted all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. What does that mean? Well, we can see it clearer, more clearly in Acts chapter 17, verse 29. There is a increase of the revelation of God. There is a difference. In times past, nations walked according to their own wills and minds. Listen to this, Acts 17. For as much, verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we are made in his image, then we ought not to think of the Godhead as like unto gold, make a golden statue of somebody or something so that's God well it can't be because I'm made in his image and I'm not a lump of, of metal of silver or stone graven by art and man's device listen and the times of this ignorance God winked at or overlooked but now at those times he overlooked them but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So we come to understand and see, dear soul, that there's a different day now. You live in a different day now. God's not going to wink anymore. God will not excuse sin. Somebody has to pay for it. It has wages associated with it. Whoever pays the wages has to die, for the wages of sin is death. For he, God the Father, hath made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God put our sin on Christ. He had to pay for it in order that we might be able to benefit from the righteousness of God himself through this. He imputed, placed into his account, our sin. He imputed, placed into our account, his righteousness. There was a time when God winked at this. There was a time when God let nations walk their own way. We read that in Acts 14. We read that here in Acts 17. But now, not anymore. You're not going to get by with it. There's only one way you can benefit from this pandemic. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, lest we grow weary and faint in our minds. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Dear soul, there is an opportunity now that's not going to endure forever. 
for sinners to come to Christ, for cold-hearted believers to re rekindle themselves to the Lord. But it won't be continuous. There was a king that had rebellion in his kingdom. He put down the rebellion and he raised a white flag up on top of the castle. And he said, as long as that flag is up there, anybody that was in rebellion against me can come now and re-pledge their allegiance to me and nothing will be done. But one day, I'm going to lower that flag and then if you haven't made it right with me about that rebellion, you will be hunted down and destroyed as an outlaw. Dear soul, listen. God Almighty, as far as I know, still has the door open and has arms outstretched for you to come and understand God. He has given you a devastating pandemic. It has driven you out of your routine, driven you out of your family gatherings, driven you out from, from sports arenas, driven you out from the grocery store. It is unbelievable how much difference there is in this day. Come to Jesus. He has given you this to drive you to him. That's what God is doing. Isn't that amazing? And dear soul, you are of the human race, and that's a blessed thing. Because the angels who kept not their first estate, Jude verse 6, are now kept in chains of darkness until judgment. This is not for angels. When the angels sinned, they fell into darkness. They never have the light and the liberty and the life that they once had. Now they are demonic and they are horrified at being tormented eternally in so much that they had rather be placed into a herd of swine than to be disembodied. But it's coming on them. Jesus, did you come here to torment us before our time? They are cringing because they know what's coming. I wish everybody in America could have that knowledge. And everybody in America could know what's coming. That this physical pandemic is nothing compared to the spiritual pandemic of sin. Study your Bible. Read in the passages in Exodus. I don't know whether we'll be able to bring more on these plagues or not. But read them. And understand and see that God was just in doing this. And that he didn't destroy everybody. What if God willing to show his wrath and make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And then made known his mercy on the vessels of grace. The vessels of mercy. They were vessels of mercy. I just showed you Egyptians came to God. Egyptians brought their cows into the house just like the Israelites did. Egyptians were at Pentecost just like the other 16 nations were. Egyptians were atoned for by Jesus Christ. By his blood hath redeemed them out of every nation. Why should you be lost? The flag is coming down one day. It may be very soon. You don't know how long it will be. Why waste another moment? You need to come to the Lord. Mm. Romans chapter 16. I believe it's the last two verses. In Romans 16, last three verses. What is the gospel all about? Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel 
and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest. The revelation of the mystery is the revelation of Jesus Christ which is the gospel is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God. Listen is made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. The gospel is to go out into all the nations for them to become obedient to God. Don't be hard-hearted like Pharaoh. Don't be stiff-necked like he was. Don't be un unconcerned and, and, and so satisfied in your religious performance like the Pharisees and the scribes were that you miss the opportunity and all those scribes and Pharisees Pharaoh Herod all of them are in hell right now I don't want that to happen to you I don't want that to happen to me I trust that you will understand that God is giving you opportunity to come to know him through this terrible time that he is bringing upon the earth. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, I want to read what Peter said. I want to preach to you what Peter preached to them. It's still the same God. We're still sinners, just like these were. And this is the responsibility. Acts 3.19 Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of restitution, excuse me, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive into the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For truly Moses said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise you up, raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass, now listen, talking about Jesus Christ, it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, will not hear Christ, shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Listen. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. It is the same God. I have the same message. Nothing, nothing any different than when Peter preached it. Last scripture. Revelation 15. Just like those ten plagues in the book of Exodus, there are also the final plagues here in the book of the Revelation, chapter 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. Why are they the last plagues? For in them is filled up the wrath of God. Everything that God has in his wrath shall be expressed. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. They were 
Not like Peter looking at the boisterous waves and sank, but they're on standing on the clear glassy sea that was holding them up. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? There it is. The whole thing was to show Pharaoh God's name, that my name might be known throughout all the earth. It was to elevate God's name among his people. And it says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. After that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. The doors are open. The angels are coming out. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were, were fulfilled. And I heard a great voice out of the temple, temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Dear soul, this thing is not over. I'm not talking about the arguments that we hear about whether this thing shall recur in the winter or not. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the wrath of God is not over yet. If there are still, or since there are still people on this earth who do not believe in the Lord Jesus, who are hard-hearted, stiff-necked like Pharaoh and said, who is God? I'm not going to pay any attention to that preacher. You don't have to, but you will bear the consequences. This thing's not over yet. God still has that wrath that is to be poured out and it will not be stopped until every last drop has been poured out. God have mercy upon us. The revelation of God is greater. God is manifesting himself to us. God is manifesting himself by his spirit and by his word in these days and yet there's so many people that don't hear it and have not come to the Lord I trust that's not you may God have mercy on our souls thank you for your attention